Well, today we're in Romans chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7, and the message relates really to what Paul speaks about here, the Christian and government. And so, as we look at this subject, we'll begin reading at verse 1, Romans 13. We'll read to verse 4, and we'll get into our study, the Christian and our civic responsibility, the Christian and government. Paul writes, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now, Paul is writing concerning our responsibilities in society, the Christian and civic responsibility. And there are at least two reasons why he begins to approach this. One, quite obviously, would be that it flows from chapter 12. Because in chapter 12, he had already stated that we were to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so in order to spread the gospel, we need to, to uh, work within the confines of civil government. See, the good and perfect will of God is to present the gospel to others, but the fact is, is we have to work within the governmental structures in order to do so. And so what he wants to do in this passage is to clarify our responsibility to human government. Now, as you look at this, we need to remember the context. We need to remember that during that time, the Jews had questions concerning the right of the Roman government to rule over them. Many at that time had a, a certain nationalism, a nas nationalistic pride, and, and they had a tremendous resentment that Rome actually had authority. Now, there was an occasion, it's uh, recorded in John's Gospel, in chapter 8, verse 33, where they, um, they had said, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. So there was a great deal of nationalism during that time. There were even nationalistic groups that had arisen in opposition to the Roman authority and all. And so they had a real problem with this. There was a great resentment against Rome. And they resented the way the Romans treated the Jews. Uh, all you need to do is begin to look in the New Testament. You'll see incidents of this and mention of it. For example, in, Ro in uh, rather Luke chapter 13, verse 1, uh, Luke writes, There were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And so that's just something that is stated there. It doesn't even give us uh, great information other than the fact that Pilate, the governor, had actually slaughtered people while they were making their offerings to God. In Acts uh, chapter 5, verses 36 and 37, um, one of the great teachers of the law, his name was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was speaking, and, and he said this. He said, for some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, drew away many people after him. He also perished. And all who obeyed him were dispersed. And so there's mention made of how the, the Romans had treated the Jews. And the Jews, many of them simply hated the Romans. That gives you insight into why there was such an antagonism towards those who collected taxes. Because when Matthew was uh, brought into faith in Jesus Christ and began to follow him, he was a, a member of a group that was greatly hated by the Jews. He was a tax collector. Because they saw that this was wrong. They believed that Rome was, was a pagan intruder and, and religious Jews really chafed at the idea of supporting pagans and this oppressive Roman government, this foreign entity that was ruling over them. And they wondered, should they or should they not support Roman authority? And you had a lot of arguments. As a matter of fact, we, we know a very famous one that took place uh, when a question was brought to the Lord Jesus Christ concerning this very thing. It's recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, where it says uh, they had come, they said to him, Teacher, 
We know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. And then they ask this question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing the hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You see, when they brought that question, it was a typical question asked at that day to start a problem. Because on the one hand, if Jesus said, no, we should not pay taxes, then they would take that statement to Roman authorities and they would say that Jesus is preaching insurrection. But if Jesus were to say to them, oh, pay it, they would take it to the religious Jews and say, see, Jesus does not care at all about our religious sentiment and our national pride. So what they had done is they tried to catch him on what is called the horns of a dilemma. How are you going to respond to this? And so Jesus said it with great wisdom. He says, you owe human government certain things, give to human government what you owe it. You owe God certain things, give to God that which belongs to him. See, man has responsibilities to God as well as to other men. We need to remember, though, that there are differences between the two. Human government relates to person-to-person -person relationships. And Paul obviously was aware of the friction that existed between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Now we need to, as I lay a foundation a little bit further, we need to remember that the church has not been established to pursue worldly power. We have had nothing but problems whenever the church has gotten entangled with the government. And ambition for power for its own sake was actually at the heart of the fall of Satan himself. You see that in, in Isaiah's book when he says in chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who did weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You see, Satan had eye problems. But it says, you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. It's this ambition for power, this desire to be like God, to rule and reign, that crept into his heart that caused him to, to fall. A, an author by the name of John Milton wrote a book called Paradise Lost. And in Paradise Lost, he quotes Satan, Lucifer, as and, and Lucifer saying, uh, to reign is Worth, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And you've heard that phrase before. That's from John Milton's Paradise Laws. Better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. That's the ambition. And that mentality of wanting to, to rule and to reign uh, permeates human government. Unfortunately, it, it seems to entice many to aspire to leadership of all forms, including political leadership. We need to remember something. We need to remember that the kingdom of God is actually ruled by different principles. And Jesus taught us that there is a principle called servant leadership. Because servant leadership is the way of the Lord. Luke tells us in chapter 22, verses 25 and 26, that Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so, but he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who is chief as one who serves. We need to understand that the kingdom of God is not synonymous with the kingdom of man. The church has been given a mandate by God, a mandate to use our influence. But we're to use our influence without compromising in order to keep favor with men. We need to use the influence that God has given to us, but not compromise that in order that we might become popular. And Jesus, speaking concerning what the church is in the Gospel of Matthew, said it like this. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown down and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, 
and it gives light to all who are in the house. You have, you are the only light, you are the only salt, is what Jesus was saying. You have influence. You're supposed to retard the corruption and to give flavor to this world. In a darkened world, you're to provide light so that people may walk without stumbling. So you have influence. All of us in this room, every believer in this room is to use that influence for good. And so we're not to be pursuing power for power's sake alone. But should the Lord put us in a place of influence, we're to use it for good. Now, Paul is speaking concerning Roman, uh, here in the book of Romans, concerning human government. And so he begins at verse 1 by simply saying this. In Romans 13, 1, he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Daniel 4, 32 says, The most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he desires. And Paul is simply echoing that. And he's saying that every believer is to submit to government's authority. And that is what has been referred to. And you hear this if you watch the news or read newspapers. That is what has been referred to, even in our own country, as the rule of law. The rule of law. This is a nation that we live in that has been established with, a, with principles of law law that is supposed to rule the elements of our life in order to give to us the ability to li live with security, to live with freedoms. And so this nation was established under the principle of what is called the rule of law. And you and I, we do not have the right to pick and choose normally which laws we're going to submit to. That's why he says that uh, every soul is to be subject. You see, every believer is to submit to governmental authority. Now, when he says to be subject, that means, the word subject means to place yourself under somebody's authority. And you see this echoed in, in uh, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15, where the apostle said, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, and to commend those who do right. He says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Now, when he says this, I need to hasten to add this. He's not saying be compliant or mindlessly follow orders. We're not like living in a totalitarian, totalitarian state where if they say do something, you just simply do it. When I was in the military, we had, and I don't remember exactly how it was phrased, but we had the right to refuse what we, what we were taught was an unlawful order. And so if I had somebody who had command authority speak to me and say to me to do a certain thing, if it violated my conscience, if I felt it was the wrong thing to do, in the military, I had the right to say to the one giving me the order that I respectfully refuse to follow that order. They would write me up and I'd have to, a court-martial and all of that, that's what would take place. And then I'd have to be defended as to why I did not follow that order. If they said, go into that village, for example, and torch it and kill all the civilians, I would have had the right to say at that time, I refuse to follow that order because it was a matter of moral and conscience. It's something that I could not do. And, and they might have handcuffed me, they may have put me someplace and then tried me later on, but I had the right to refuse. You see, so you have a right to refuse a, a, an order that's given to you that is going to violate your conscience or your morals. We'll look at that in just a moment. Because you see, there are times when need, we need to choose to serve God or the government. The government as it exists is not to replace God or a devotion that belongs only to Him. And we need to remember that civil law is established to restrain evil from dominating and as such... We are to be submitted to proper authority as long as it doesn't replace God's law. In the United States, if a law or government action violates our consciences and understanding of God's word, we have a right to address it and we have a right to reject it. And as Americans, there are many concerns for us that we ought to voice our thoughts about. And it is our responsibility to exercise our rights in this country and we should participate and making our voices heard. That's what it means to be salt, and that's what it means to be light. We don't have to be belligerent, and we don't have to be mean-spirited, but we certainly have to have a spine, and we need to stand up and say, I will or will not 
do certain things. Just because it's law doesn't make it right. Just because it may be legal doesn't make it moral. And we need to understand that. We see that today. Many Americans have a tendency of establishing moral values and moral beliefs based on what is lawful, what is legal to do. So if it's legal to smoke pot in certain ways, then somebody says, well, that's obviously moral. If it's legal to have an abortion, someone will say, well, that's obviously moral, it's proper. If somebody says that two men or two women can get married, there are those who will argue and say that it's legal, therefore it's moral. But as a, as a Christian, I have the right to say, no, that violates my moral code. That violates my understanding of Scripture. And just because a governor may sign into law a certain law that makes certain practices uh, and behaviors acceptable doesn't mean that I have to accept it, and it doesn't mean that I, as a pastor, have to preach that. I will not do that. So if the government says to me that I need to rent out these buildings here to those who violate our standards and our beliefs, that I have to rent out, this is, this is something that uh, uh, California is, is dealing with right now. Some of you may be familiar with this. But if uh, we'll say uh, uh, homosexuals get married and they want to, one, they want us to perform the ceremony, or two, they want us to rent to them our, um, our fellowship hall for, the, for them to have their uh, re, uh, um, whatever that thing is that they call it after they get married, uh, funeral or something, I forget, <laughs> moment of sorrow, where they have their reception. There are those that are arguing that I, as a pastor, have to rent the facility out to those who want to rent it. And of course, we're not going to do that. Of course, we won't. We wouldn't do that. Why would we do that? Because it violates our beliefs. And if they say, well, we'll put you in jail, then, then I'm going to go to jail with a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors because none of us will do that. Why? Because it violates our conscience, and we won't do it. We won't do it. Yeah. You're clapping because you're not going to go to jail. <laughs> I'll resign. No. <laughs> My assistant will go to jail. But I'm telling you, that's just a fact, isn't it? I mean, there are some laws that are just immoral, and we do not have to abide by those laws. We can, in good conscience, stand up. And so he's not saying that every single thing that every government does is proper. He's not saying that. What he's laying is a general principle, a general foundation, that government is established for certain things, that God is the author of government. When you look into the first nine chapters of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, you find three institutions ordained by God. You see marriage, you see the church, and you see human government. All of this is established within nine chapters, and all of that are building blocks. Those things are building blocks to the foundations of an orderly society. And so we have the right to voice our opinions. We have the right to resist the authority when what the authority is attempting to do is bring us to submit to that which is not proper. So it's our responsibility to exercise our rights in this country. We should participate, even as it says in Proverbs 14, 34, Righteous exalts a nation, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But there are those who argue and say, well, there's no authority except from God, so we're to submit to every law. Is that true? What about laws that are contrary to the law of God? What happens when a civil law violates a higher law? Remember with me in the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, where it says there, the king of Egypt said uh, to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Chipra and Anpua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Is that what they should have done? I mean, it was a command. The, the, the Pharaoh said, kill him. Well, what did they do? Well, the midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And that's how Moses was able to survive because they resisted and refused to obey that law. Laws that do not contradict God's laws are to be obeyed because God has established civil authority and the law normally parallels his law. Somebody has said, man, I've had these discussions in the past. Perhaps some have had this same kind of discussion where they have said, you cannot legislate morality. You can't legislate morality. 
Is that true? Is that true? Think about it with me for a minute. Perhaps you haven't ever thought of it. Some of you, I'm sure, have thought this through yourselves already. You do not legislate morality. Then what are you legislating when you, when you capture somebody for killing somebody? And why do we call that murder? Uh, what are you legislating when somebody goes into a bank and robs it and we arrest them and we call it uh, robbery? We call it stealing. Where did you get the idea that, that somebody shouldn't kill somebody else? And where did you get the idea that somebody shouldn't steal? And are the laws actually establishing morality or preserving it? And are the laws in and of themselves, are they moral and if so, why are they moral? And where did you get the morality to have that law in the first place? And what we need to remember simply is that the United States is based in its code and its ethics and its laws are based on uh, the Old and New Testament laws. And so killing is a moral thing. And stealing is something moral. Even weddings and marriage are moral. All of the laws that you have in the United States relate to behaviors and there is a moral aspect to them. And so I really believe very strongly that, that laws that do not contradict God's law is to be obeyed. But those that do not coincide with our understanding of Scripture, well, I'm going to appeal to a higher law. It's like what it says in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, when the apostle Peter and John had been forbidden to speak in the name of Christ. And Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which you have seen and heard. You think that I'm supposed to follow what you're saying or what God says. And that's what we're to do. Now he says in verse 2, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So as a general rule, government can be benevolent and of benefit to believers. Laws generally protect people from harm as well as promoting the well-being of community. It also provides punishment for those who violate the law. And so he says, uh, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and then bring judgment on themselves. Why? Well, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what's good. You'll have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. If you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So, there you go. Judgment, conscience. It's interesting how he puts both of those in the same passage. You're on the freeway, speed limit 65. Everybody knows that you can actually go five miles faster than 65 because we've created that five-mile cushion. And sometimes you can go 80 because there's nobody around, right? Or faster because you're breaking in something. So as you're driving... You're looking at your speedometer, 65, 70, 80. Mm. You get lost in the drive. I mean, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. You're outside of L.A. You're going north. It's a lot of stretches of empty road up there. And you look off to the side. Then you look behind you, and you see a black and white car. What's the very first thing you do? Very first. You slow down, I look at the speedometer. It's the first thing I'll do, mm. okay. Why did I do that? Because I'm guilty of violating the law. I can be by habit, I, you know, there's nobody here. But man, the second I see a black and white, the first thing I do is I look at my speedometer. That's one of the reasons I'm glad that I have one of these cars that you can actually have a cruise control. You can put it at a certain speed, take your foot off, and and just drive, because it's easy to let a car, we, we call it, we let the car get away from us. No, I just keep pushing my foot down, and I keep going fast. 
But it's amazing to me, the minute I see a police officer, that I check to make sure I'm keeping the law. Why is that? Because of fear of judgment. Paul's referring to that, that principle. There are people who do what is right for fear of judgment. That's why they do what is right. It's not because they believe it. It's not because it's their moral code. It's because it's against the law. You may believe with all of your heart that it's okay to smoke pot. You may think it's just fine to do that, and you may want to argue, you know, and, and, and all of that about it. But if you're sitting there smoking a joint, and a police officer rolls up next to you, what do you do with that joint? You eat it. <laughs> if you throw it, they can pick it up. How do I know that? Well, someone told me about that years ago. <laughs> Why? You want to argue all day long. You argue with your parents. You argue with your friends. You argue with everybody that it's okay, it's harmless. Then why? Why did you do that? Well, you do it because, you know, it's against the law. Now, the difference is doing things right because of conscience sake. Why don't I smoke pot and drive? Because for conscience sake, I don't smoke pot. Why don't I go 95 and 100 when it's empty and it's 4 in the morning? You know, there's nobody on the freeway. For conscience sake, I'm not going to speed. Why do I stop at stop signs, which are a suggestion to many people today, when in reality it's a law? Why do I stop at stop signs? And, and I do it in my neighborhood. We have stop signs. I stop at everyone. Of course, I don't roll through. I know there's nobody around. It's 4 o'clock. Who's going to be up at 4? Just me. I can just roll through all of those stop signs. There's nobody there. But what happens when I see a sheriff sitting next to that stop sign? I hit the stop sign. One, two, three, then drive off. Why is that? Because you can do it through conscience or you can do it through fear of judgment. What is Paul saying? He's saying, listen, either you can be afraid of, being, of violating the law and do what right, is right because of that, or you can be aware of the fact that your conscience has been tenderized by God's spirit and you do the right thing out of the heart. What is the higher form? What is the highest form of doing right, guys? Because it's legal or because your heart has been tenderized by God's spirit? Which is the highest? Well, obviously, conscience. You do things that are right because it doesn't violate your conscience any longer. And a lot of us didn't have a conscience till we got saved. And then our conscience became informed by God's word. And we began to do what is right from the heart instead of just because I'm going to get arrested for it. So there are those who do what is right because, well, because the government is God's avenger on those who do what is wrong. And therefore, they'll do what is right. But if they had the opportunity to do wrong, they do it whenever they're given po uh, uh, opportunity to do so. And then there are others who simply do what is right because it's the right thing. I was walking and in, in front of a young couple uh, a few years ago now, and the young lady was griping to her boyfriend or friend she was walking with, saying, that old man, it wasn't me, but some other old man, that old man man, he just was going the speed limit, man, because he's old. So she's probably thinking that if he was young, he'd be just busting through the speed limit and do what he wanted because young people do that because they're not afraid because they got these quick reflexes and they got great brakes. I don't know what she was thinking. But in her mind, she's thinking that the reason this old person was going the speed limit was because he's an old person and only old people obey the law. And she immediately was revealing to me that this woman has no conscience at all. For her to do right or wrong is a matter of choice and what it feels like at this moment. And you and I, we're different. We're believers. We read the Bible. The Bible says to obey the ordinances, and we do. Why? Because we're able to live at peace. God established government. He keeps us safe through it. Before I was saved, I did not like police officers. I had every good reason not to like them because they were always after me. I didn't like them. You know, I had mace sprayed in my face and things, and they weren't very nice to me. And I didn't like them. I got saved. When I got saved, I started saying, God, thank you for the police. Thank you for law enforcement. Thank you for, for them because they take care of us so I can live a peaceful life. Bless you, Lord, for them. I have relatives who are police officers, and I love them. 
because of the good that they do, and they put their lives on the line for me. I appreciate them very much, but I didn't before I was saved. Well, why? Because I was drinking and driving, smoking pot, doing drugs, carrying things with me I shouldn't carry, because if they rolled over and pulled me over, I'd be going to jail because I was afraid of them, because I was always holding, or I was, I was in the place that I could have been arrested so many times. And so Paul is simply saying, listen, God has appointed government, and we should not violate law, and we don't violate law because of matters of conscience. Notice in verses 6 and 7, finally, he says, because of this, you pay taxes, for they're God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Christians recognize human government is a design of the Lord, and therefore we should be the best citizens in the country. We pay our taxes. We serve our country. We do our best to respect our officials. We pray for those who are in office. We vote. Sometimes even get involved in the political process in order that we might continue to do the best that we can to ensure that we can live in the best country this world has seen and to live in peace. And that's what we're supposed to do. Government has been established to restrict evil and to promote the welfare of people. And we should pray for our officials. We should pray from president all the way down to governors and everything else, mayors, that, that God might reach their hearts and, and touch them and, and that God would save them and that this government might survive. And we might, at least this nation might survive, and we, we pray that God will keep us safe in this, in this country that we live in and as believers. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep the law as long as it doesn't violate my conscience. And when it violates my conscience, I would rather obey God than man. And that's what I'll do, and that's what we'll do. We'll do the best that we can to live within this framework of government that God has given to us, that we might live at peace and take this message and continue to give it out, human government. It's not the same as the kingdom of God. We owe certain things to the kingdom of God, certain things to the kingdom of man. They're not the same. They're not identical. But we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that belong to God.